All right. Welcome, Elder Care Network. And uh, thank you very much to our uh, co-host, Linda, for being flexible with this time. I've got a lot of uh, work travel and due next week as well. So she's been uh, kind to uh, modify our recording sessions. And I'm excited to be able to have her back for Grief Gab Episode 7, uh, which it looks like we're going to talk about some educational resources. Right, Linda? Episode, yeah, I've got, um, well, what we're talking about today in seven is reconciliation versus recovery. Excellent. Um, but yeah, I'll just be sharing some information about that and some thoughts and we'll share that with you and we'll go from there. Okay, wonderful. Well, the floor is yours. Thank you again for joining us. This is Linda Finley with Morning <clears throat> Discoveries and uh, episode seven and away we go. Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so today's session, um, I'd like to talk about um, reconciliation of grief. And um, oftentimes I, I want to speak to the fact that a lot of people don't understand the grief journey in general, but those who are grieving, obviously that grief goes on for much longer than they would ever imagine. And then we get to a point where maybe some people in, in their lives are, are expecting them to be over it. You know, when you're grieving, you don't have a path forward. So I, I again, I bring always back to my own personal experience when I lost my daughter. I just wanted somebody to tell me how long was I going to have to feel that way? Because I felt that if I had an end point to that, to the grief, that I would then survive it somehow. And, and when you're in the midst of it, you really don't, again, have the brain capacity to think much other than, you know, to feel your grief and to go through that that process. Um, and, and so when we talk about reconciliation, I like to put that next to recovery. So how do we how do we recover from grief? How do we get over grief? I hate that that statement. A lot of people will tell others who are grieving, oh, you should be over this by now. And there is really no end point to grief. I truly believe that throughout our lives, if we lose somebody that we've lost, there's going to be times, you know, we talked in one of the sessions about triggers. There's going to be times that we actually feel as though that loss had happened today. I mean, we can go back to that. Does it debilitate us? No. Is it is it okay that it comes back to those raw feelings? Yes, it is, because we're human. Um, we're never going to forget that we lost our loved one. We're trying to struggle through, trying to figure out how we're going to get through the rest of our lives without them. And so I think it's more that instead of reconciling the loss, it's like it's never going to be acceptable to me that I lost my daughter. It's never going to be acceptable to me that I lost my mom at an early age. So so those those words that people use, again, it comes down to people don't know what to say. So they say things that make us feel like we're doing something wrong. And then simply people don't say anything because it's easier. And I've probably said that before in one of our sessions. It's, it just comes down to that. And so today I'm going to talk about more of recovering from the initial response from grief um, as opposed to you know reconciliation, because I don't think people are ever going to reconcile. So, so what does reconciliation mean? So you can change to the next slide, please. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious about one thing, Linda, before we uh, do this. I'm I'm thinking that there's a very powerful uh, statement that you made uh, as far as what people uh, tend to say. And they're saying, you know, that uh, first of all, they're projecting their own opinion. And I figured like that could be disastrous uh, on, you know, for a number of things. And I think that people tend to speak from a lens of sympathy rather than empathy. Uh, and uh, as Brene Brown said, you know, empathy, uh, rarely do empathy statements begin with the, uh, with the letter I. And, uh, and I think that we always do that. And I'm wondering, at some point during this, um, I could use some coaching of what are some good things to be able to say that are empathic statements that are not meant to trigger something of saying, well, you, you know, it's been a year, you shouldn't feel like this anymore. Um, it'd be nice to be able to have our audience be able to have some um, some some good kind of fallback statements, if you will, or just making sure that they're aware of, you know, maybe things that are positive things to say. Uh, I'd love it if you could weave those in during uh, the presentation today. Yeah, well, I'll weave it in now only because I want to get past the slides and I completely forget about <laughs> because my, brain, my bandwidth and my brain as I've gotten older is not as good. But, you know, yeah, I think when we're trying to be helpful to people who are grieving, I think first off, just try to recognize that there is no end point to the grief, right? So I think that people generally recognize that first year is gonna be really hard. And, and then I think after that, they think, well, you've gone through all the first. As somebody who wants to be supportive of that, I as a, as, as a, as a support person would wanna be recognizing, you know, maybe some special days and, and bringing it up. 
You know what I mean? I think the biggest thing that we can do for people is bringing it up and creating that space for them to be able to share what it what it is. Um, even mm -hmm. if it's a, you know a, a general holiday, even if it's you know Valentine's Day or you know whatever holiday, religious holidays that people celebrate, or Mother's Day or Father's Day, I think that gives us opportunity to say, you know, if you lost, you know, if, if we know that you lost your dad. I think that it's okay to say, geez, you know, how, how are the holidays? How is Father's Day for you going forward? You know, how's that been for you? Do you do anything on that day that, that you feel as though you're honoring your dad? I mean, I think the biggest thing we can do, and I know it's like a catch-all answer, is to always provide that opportunity for people to have, to be able to talk and to say what it is for them that they're going through. Um, and, and always make, and, and it's okay to preface by, I can't imagine what it's like. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what it's like that, you know, your dad's no longer here for Father's Day or your mom's no longer here for Mother's Day. Or I can't imagine what it must be like that, you know, the birthday's coming up of your loved one. I think we need to make that extra effort to try and recognize those special days because that's what we need to do when we're grieving. We need to talk about what we're feeling and what we're experiencing, and we need to feel safe in doing that. And so as caregivers, I think if we can provide that safe opportunity for them to talk and really be interested you know, I, I genuinely am interested, you know, I, I, I want to know, you know, how it's going for people, even if mm -hmm. a year has gone by or five years has gone by, you know, um, we're always going to miss our loved ones. So I hope that answers your question, like in a nutshell, always create that time and safe space that people can, can respond to a question that you're, you're asking. You know, we talk about active listening and part of active listening is being able to ask questions to generate conversation. So that's, I think, the best thing we can do for people. You know, send a note. I, I often send notes to people, either, especially a card in the mail or something is different. You know, we always get bills in the mail. So it's okay to send a card in the mail saying, no, you know, Father's Day's coming up and I'll be thinking about you. You know, put a note through email, a text message, however way you can connect with that person and open that space. And, and the more that we do this, the more the other person's going to be more comfortable with sharing but on their own. And so you do open up that two-way communication. It's a, it's a wonderful statement. Thank you for that, Linda. Yeah, no, uh, you're please, welcome. Please continue. <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. okay. Okay, so we're talking about reconciliation. So so how do we know when we're at a place that we are moving along, right? So, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this first, that, you know, sometimes people feel as though they've made a few steps forward. And it's okay that they feel like they've made a couple steps backwards, right? So it's okay that if we feel, geez, I haven't cried in, in a week or I haven't cried in a month or some months have gone by and I hadn't felt that deep sadness. Well, I think that the big part of that is that we generally do effectively express the reality of the death and how we do that again is, is to be able to talk about how this person is missing from our life and all the ways that they're not part of our life anymore. Right. So when we talk about loss, it's not just that person dying and they're no longer right in front of you. It's all the ways that their lives are intertwined. So we, we begin to realize all those different ways, even if it's just like a traditional. I know up in upstate New York, we're big with fish fries during the fall and in the spring. You know, and if you ever, always went to a fish fry every Friday with your loved one and all of a sudden the fall comes up and here you've got these fish fries coming up again, you're experiencing the reality of the loss because your loved one's not going to that fish fry. And to somebody else that might be, well, it's kind of, you know, but no, it is very powerful for the person who's grieving all those different things that help them to, to express that, that that person has died. And so, and, and, and then another thing we need to do is embrace the pain while, nurture, while nurturing ourselves, right? I think that we ultimately do realize when we're grieving that joy and grief can coexist. And being able to allow ourselves to enjoy the, the good, you know, something that's making us feel happy. If we're doing something to take care of ourselves, if we're nurturing ourselves, that's a positive indication that, okay, you're moving along. You know, I had a lady, I had my, I have a monthly support group I run every month. And one of the ladies last night said, you know, I had to realize that I needed to take care of myself and that it was okay to take care of myself. You know, she took care of her mom for many years. And when she lost her, here she was just struggling. And now what? What's my day now? And she said, I realized that if I don't take care of myself and do things that's going to help me to really experience my grief, I'm just going to stuff it in and it's not going to do me any good. She learned that and shared that last night. And I told her, I said, that's brilliant that you that you you were able to say that at this point. And that does indicate that we are moving on. So then we also need to convert the relationship from one of presence to one of memory. And that's the grief work that we do during that first year, during that second year and beyond, is really 
converting that relationship. They're not physically there, but then how do we make them a part of our life so that we feel as though they're part of our lives? And we've talked about that before. And oftentimes we feel like we have a new self-identity and that's really hard too. You know, a spouse no longer has their, their, their loved ones. So you're no longer a couple. So who are you? So trying to figure out who I am and to establish that new identity. Some people go through that whole thing. And that's an indication if you're really thinking about that and trying to feel as though, you know, you can now go with your group of friends. You're just one where you were two and you feel a little bit more comfortable about that. That's an indication that that you're coming along a little bit. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. we so profound that we have a new meaning of life. You know, I think that when we lose a loved one, it really puts life into perspective. You know, nobody promises us tomorrow. And I think that loss helps us to know that, you know, make that phone call today. Say those things today that you want you want your loved ones to know. And, and then we need to develop lasting networks of support. And that really is helpful, too. I tell people that's part of the grief work is finding those people, whether it's in a support group, whether it's other bereaved people in other settings. Those are the things that we need to do is to, is to, to get out there, not isolate ourselves. And, and that's a sign of okay, I'm ready now. I can, I can, you know, move forward. Those are steps going forward. And I think people feel accomplished when they start doing things on this list and it helps them to feel that. And, and again, they don't recognize what I've just said in their own right, right? They're kind of doing these things, but for somebody to kind of share that with them and say, hey, are you looking into, you know, going with people, hanging around with people that, you know, have had a loss? That's good. That's positive. Um, so these are just some things that can indicate to somebody who's grieving that, yeah, I am I am doing a little better with the idea and the understanding that you may feel like you're doing better for a certain period of time, but then you might take some steps backwards and have some bad days or a bad hour or whatever it is. That doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. That just means that that is part of the journey. So I'm going to switch the slide, please. So recover, do we ever really recover from grief? And again, I, I, the words that we use, I think we recover from the all of the raw emotional experience of grief. I think that we recover from that piece, the most painful part of it. It's almost like when you have a surgery, you have that time period where you're, you know, you're in a lot of pain because of the surgery and you're, you're tired and you want to sleep. And then as you go along and you heal, like two months later, you feel like yourself again. Right. And so we'd like mm -hmm. it to grief only. I think it's a longer period of time that we get to that point. So I think um, when we talk about recovery, we recover more from the initial deep sorrow, sadness that we feel when that loved one has died. And then the, the frequency of feeling that sadness gets less and less. And it does not mean that, you know, we're forgetting our loved one. It just means that we are then, we're churning through our grief. We're learning to live with it being a part of who we are. We're allowing ourselves to, you know, to have some joy in the midst of the grief. And so, so that to me is recovery from that piece of it. But then there's always, again, those days down the road that you will find yourself in a puddle of tears, you know, feeling as though, oh my gosh, it feels as though this, this happened today. Um, mm -hmm. And that's all normal. It's all okay. Um, it doesn't happen for all people. Everybody's different. But again, we talk about recovery and grief. It is mainly that first time period where you're really deep in mourning and deep in sorrow. Um, we couldn't live if we had to experience that every single day. Our minds, our bodies would not sustain that. So we can't stay in that that deep mourning. Um, nobody can grieve 24-7, 365 days a year. That just We wouldn't survive that. Um, so, so that's recovery. We think about recovering from those initial, you know, whether it's six months, a year, we often say brief parents out to five years, they still feel that deep sorrow. They still feel it throughout the rest of their lives. But I'm talking about the frequency of it is more during this, this period. Um, so hopefully that helps some people to understand that again, this is, we're going to talk about recovery, like we're going to be over it. We don't get over it. Okay. So I know, again, there's a lot of information on this slide, but some signs of reconciliation. I kind of borrowed this from Alan Wolfelt. We all know who he is. He's wonderful. He has a lot of good um, information for families. And again, some of this I've already talked about, but recognizing the reality and finality of the death. And I think that that is something, and I don't know how it was for you, Jonathan, when you lost your dad, but it, it's almost like a shock to your system that I'm never going to see my, my dad again. You know, like they're no longer in this space on this earth. And, and again, you know, that's us recognizing that, you know, death is final. We aren't going to see them again until, again, depending on our beliefs and what, what our belief system is, we hope that we see them again in, in heaven or whatever, our, you know, we term is that. Um, so, but recognizing that and really 
coming to terms with it in, in some way. It's not as much of a shock, right? So, you know, a couple of years later, it's not as much of a shock as it was those first few months. Um, a return to normal eating and sleeping patterns. People have a lot of trouble with, with appetite and sleeping. So um, we know that we're doing better if maybe we're back to some normal sleeping patterns. And again, this isn't going to happen immediately. This is going to happen down the road. Um, less preoccupation of thoughts about the loved one. You know, and again, referring to my own loss, I can remember um, my daughter died on a Friday. Every Friday I was counting. This was, it's been a week. It's been two weeks. It's been 10 weeks. It's been, and I don't remember at this point how many weeks, but it's like every week I knew, like I can tell you exactly how many weeks it was to the minute that she died. And so I think when we, when that lessens for us, we're, we're less preoccupied with the loss, the circumstances of the loss, the sorrow, we know that we're, we're moving along. And again, learning to accept joy and grief that, that can co they can coexist. And with that sometimes comes in, you know, people feel guilty that they're enjoying something, you know, and I think that we learn that we, we are entitled to that. And that's where we need to be is to be able to enjoy life again and recognizing my loved one would want that for me. You know, my loved one would want me to enjoy life, but you're not going to convince somebody early in grief. You're not going to convince them of that. They're still going to feel that that guilt that, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be having a good time. I shouldn't be laughing or smiling or, you know, whatever. It, it's just not appropriate. Well, they in their own right will get beyond that. Um, finding me and maintaining new and healthy relationships. You know, again, what does this mean? It can mean different things for different people. If you have somebody who's lost a spouse, maybe the time has come that they feel that they want to, you know, have another relationship with somebody and, and not be alone. And I do have to share this one little story because I think it's a, I call it a cute story, but I had this gentleman come through one of my groups. This was years ago. He was like 89 years old and he came in. It was a, a, a group for loss of a spouse. He came in and that first session, he was so upset and he was crying and, you know, he lost his wife. They'd been married for 60 years and the whole group was really kind to him and, you know, sympath empathetic, really, um, mm -hmm. and, and just very sympathetic to him and allowed for him to share his grief. And they all had a good, you know, conversation about it. Second session, he came in, this is like over the course of six weeks, second session, he came in, still, he was very weepy and sad and everybody was real you know, supportive of him. By the third session, he came in and he shared with the group that he met a lady in the assisted living home that he was living in. And you can tell that the posture in the room just changed, you know, like this has been three weeks, you know, this is the third session. So anyways, they're a little tolerant of that. By the fourth session, he came in and was talking about how him and this lady friend of him had gotten together for dinner every night. And they both were able to talk about their spouses. And he finally felt some, some happiness and all that kind of thing. And I had several other bereaved spouses that night say to me, what's going on with this guy? It's only been three weeks. Like what is happening? And, and fourth week he did the same thing. And I think by the sixth session, this, this gentleman came in and he said, we've decided we're going to move in together and, and save on expenses because we're living in the same assisted living facility. We're going to move in together. And these people, some of these people were so appalled at that. But he said on that last session, he said, I, I was married for 60 years to my wife and there's nothing I regret. I regret nothing. We had a great life together and I have some life to live and I'm going to live that life and I'm going to try and enjoy that life. And they finally got it. You know what I'm saying? It was kind of hard. Sure. For, I, I had a, year, a younger spouse, a, a male who had lost his wife and he was completely appalled. He would stay afterwards and say, I could never think about dating. And I said, okay, that's good. You feel that way now. And that's okay if you feel like that for the rest of your life. But this man is obviously being able to do this process a little quicker and maybe a lot more quicker than anybody else. And and I just thought it was just nice how, how he started out and everybody was real supportive. And then they're kind of like, what is going on here? But again, there's a lesson in that, that we all do this on different time frames. You know, particularly when you're talking about the loss of a spouse, some some spouses will never remarry again, but others at some point are ready for that. And, it, and it's OK. Um, you know, Linda, I, I that that means a lot to me uh, of that story you shared, because, first of all, you know, Stephen Covey said that uh, we tend to see the world through our own home movies, which means it's human nature for me to think that you see the world through the same lens as I do. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. And that's a perfect example of that. Um, it's it's easy to be able to try to put yourself into somebody's shoes and say, you know, how would I feel in this situation? Or, you know, it, it's, it, 
I, I think it's so refreshing to be faced with something of a different point of view and have the trust, decency, open-mindedness to eventually accept, you know, uh, where they're coming from. Cause I think that could be part of their own healing process as well of saying, okay, well, you know, we don't know what he went through on the days that he wasn't, you know, in, in group sessions of, you know, what, what was the last, you know, five years of their lives together and where were they planning for this all along? Um, I, I, I think it's just a, a beautiful, uh, moment in time to allow ourselves to get better by, um, accepting. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's well said. Thank you. Okay. So going back to, so um, people start experiencing a drive to organize and place one's life toward the future, plan one's life toward the future. And I'm going to use the grief cruise as an example here is that, you know, when I talk to people, I do get some reluctancy. I get some people saying, well, I don't know if it's too soon. I don't know if I should be doing this. I got to grab my dog or he's going to peek and start barking at me. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I just don't know if I should be doing this. And then as we go along, they, they start feeling excited about it, like looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. And so they, they start realizing. So even in that process between that first phone call and them being a little reluctant to them actually having to call and make their final payment. And now they're excited. You know, they're like, mm -hmm. I got something to look forward to. And I think, again, that's a heartwarming when I see people that really are making plans, whether it's as simple as, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do a dinner night every night with friends going forward. I mean, it can be something as simple as that, but, you know, actually planning for the future, I think is a good sign that we're reconciling our, our initial most painful part of our loss. Um, the serenity to become comfortable with the way things are rather than attempting to make things as they were. Mm. That's a really important piece that people get to at some point is that, you know, they do realize that I can't keep going back to, you know, this is how I did things. Sometimes we have to do things differently. And again, going through that whole process of accepting that and then actually initiating all of that is healing. It, it's, it's signs of healing for people. Um, the versatility to welcome more change in life. Um, again, initially when we're grieving, it's almost like we can't take any anymore. We just can't take any more change. We can't take anything else. And then we get to a point where then, and again, that bandwidth starts to increase. And so we're able to take more change and be more accepting of it. Um, the awareness that they have allowed themselves to fully grieve and they have survived. You know, people mm -hmm. realize, I, I don't know how I got through that, but I did. You know, I think of myself, I, I was, my sister was here over the weekend and I said to her, I says, you know, Diane, when I think back to those initial days, I, I shared with her and I probably shared it with her a thousand times that the day that I left the hospital without my child, that I, I, I just so clearly to this day, remember standing in that doorway and it was so sunny out and it was very humid and it was what would otherwise be a beautiful day. And I, I just remembered in my brain thinking I got to make, when my husband was going to pull up with the car, I was going to step off this step. And somehow I knew that I was, I was stepping into a world that I didn't want to be in, not the way that it was. And wow. you know, we remember those things very clearly. You know, it was like just a moment in time that I was like, I felt like I was just going through some threshold that I had no idea what it was. And it was just so mm -hmm. frightening to me. And, you know, the whole experience was, you know, frightening and scared me like I've never been scared before. Um, so anyway, so the acquaintance of new parts of themselves that they have discovered in their grief journey. So I think we do learn about ourselves when we're grieving. We learn about, you know, what we can what we can tolerate, what we can't. And I think that again, we have a more appreciation of life itself. And then we become more accustomed to that. And, and it does change us. But I mostly think for most people, it changes us for the positive. You know, there are people, because again, we're all different, there are people that are changed for the worse. And I hate seeing that. You know, I hate seeing that people become very pessimistic. Everything is negative. The glass is half empty instead of half full. And they mm -hmm. just go the rest of their lives like that. And there's probably, if they're not open to help and they're not open to, to you know, support, that's how they're going to live the rest of their lives. And to me, that's really sad. Heartbreaking. You know, it, it is. It is heartbreaking. I, I've seen that um, with, you know, loss of spouse. I've seen it more with loss of a child. People are just, you sure. know, I've worked with families that have lost an only child. And they don't have any other children, no grandchildren. You know, we really need to get those people connected and, and give them some purpose in life because they just, at that point, they don't. And sometimes they stay like that. And that's really sad mm -hmm. to me. Um, so that's the hope that does not happen for people. Well, let's see, where do I leave off? Please? Adjustments to new roles that have resulted from the loss of a relationship. Again, if you've lost an only child, what do you do when somebody says, oh, how many children do you have? Like, how do you handle yeah. that? 
You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Even to this day, people say, how many children do I have? And depending on who it is and what, how I feel. And I mean, I'm 30, 34 years out. Sometimes I say one and I still have that tinge of guilt. I'm still like, Oh yeah, I really had two. you know what I'm saying? So I just pick mm -hmm. and choose the things, but it's not uncomfortable for me. It's not, doesn't cause me any heartache. It's just, I'm so used to it. It is what it is. And mm -hmm. then acknowledging that the pain of the loss is an in inherent part of life resulting from the ability to give and receive love. Right. So you've probably often heard that like, the price of, you know, love is, is the grief. We have to mm -hmm. grieve those people, the loss of them, their lives. And so that is just, it goes hand in hand. We cannot love and not grieve. It just can't happen. Um, so with all of that, where are we here? Okay. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is kind of my conclusion of this. It wasn't as long as some of the other um, sessions that we've had, but again, I just want, I, it's important to me to just help people to know that again, there's no time frame in our grief journey if we just take some baby time time some tiny baby steps from this point to that point sometimes we'll take some backwards know that that you are progressing you're not you know laying in bed every day for a year straight i mean i've talked to people early on in grief they tell me i can't get out of my pajamas and i say to them if i'm talking to you a year from now and you're still telling me that we might have a different conversation you know, am I going to say that a year is, you know, you're over it and you need to not be in bed, but let's talk about that. You know, we will talk more about that if we're still doing that a year from now. Um, and I just, I think again, for people, they just want to know generally, like I did myself, how long is this going to last? And I always say that it's not so much the time that goes by, it's more important what we do at that time. And what we're doing with that time is the grief work. You know, we talk about mm -hmm. grief it's very difficult and it's and and again in addition to people having to work through their grief they still have to take care of a home they have to take care of families perhaps they have to go to work they have other obligations so it's amazing how people do and are able to do all of those things and they do but it's Indeed. the more support we can provide during that whole process and that whole time that's what we can do for people is to be there and to be able to listen and be able, be able to create those opportunities, like I just said, to, to open those opportunities for a safe space to talk. And so I came up with this this um, this meme. I believe the hardest part of healing after you've lost someone you love is to recover the you that went away with them. Um, and then I did I did send you. Um, do you have another slide after that, or you do not? Because I sent you a. I a, don't know. Yes, oh, you do. Growing mm -hmm. around. Grief. Do you see that? Yep. Okay, I got to make mine bigger so I can read it for you. So I just saw this. I just saw this last night and or yesterday, and I added it to the presentation because again, it just encompasses what I just read for you. Um, growing around grief is that you know people um, think that grief starts out um, like big and then it gets slower with time, but in reality, it starts out big and the same size, but slowly life beyond that grows bigger around it. So I think that that kind of says more of what I had said. I believe the hardest part of healing after you've lost someone you love is to recover the you that went away with them. And I think that that really tells us, it really shows us what we ultimately need to do, right? It's like the grief isn't going to define us anymore. We're going to, we're going to have a new definition in our life and we're going to experience life the way it's intended to be experienced with joy and happiness. Um, and so it's not so much letting the grief go away. It's me coming out of that grief. And I thought that's a nice way to conclude what I was talking about today with the reconciliation and the recovery. Um, it's a great image. Yeah. Yeah. Makes no, a lot I of love, sense. I saw that. I was like, oh, that goes perfect. I got to resend this, this <laughs> presentation to Jonathan. But so do you have any questions about anything? No, you know, we, we're a little shorter today, Linda, but um, this really hits home. You know, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, this is such a difficult journey. You know, you, you just, you don't wish this on anybody. Uh, loss is hard and in uh, our ability to recover from this, you know, or, or just to get back to ourselves. Um, we, we all need help and we need guidance. We need reassurance. Uh, and, and we need, you know, the people that love us in our lives to, to help us through this. And, uh, just providing the resources you have, it, it means a lot to me. I'm uh, personally grateful, and uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm a little more sentimental with this uh, with this week's lesson than than others. Um, and uh, it, it explains a lot. It makes me feel better about my grief journey. And um, yeah, it's it it takes it takes work. 
Yeah, and it does. And, you know, that's that's always my hope. And, you know, I'm so willing to share the information, the grief care education to en in any way that I can, because it really is lacking in our society. I mean, you don't get grief care in, in you know, most funeral homes. You don't get grief care from a nursing home facility or assisted living facility or a senior center. I mean, this information really needs to be put out to, to anybody who comes in contact with somebody who's grieving because the person themselves is the one on the journey. They're the ones that need the support. So it's up to maybe some other entities, you know, particularly, like I say, funeral homes, senior, you know, living facilities, that if this information is available, then at least it's there for them to access. And that makes it a little bit better. Does it make their grief go away? No, there's going to be nothing. You know, I always say, I wish I had a remote control that can just, you know, go from here to there. And and there you are at the end of your, 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 your grief journey, but it just doesn't work that way. So I think the more we can get this information out, because there really is no infrastructure. I don't know if you and I, we can have these conversations outside of the grief gap session, but there is no infrastructure to deliver grief care for families. If you think about it, there isn't. So what can we do to change that? And I'm hoping to make a small little tiny difference in that and to close that gap if we can. Now you're doing more than a small, uh, <laughs> a small piece. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for sharing your wisdom here. And, uh, and once again, if people have questions about this particular session, want to reach out and be able to have a discussion about you or, you know, widening your audience to be able to, uh, to, to, to guide some other people. How do they reach you? Okay. They can go on the web, uh, my website, it's www.morningdiscoveries.com and that's M O U R N I N G discoveries.com. You can call me. I'd be happy to talk to anybody. Um, and we can just have a conversation about grief. I mean, that's what it's about. What can we do to help families? And then today's with today's session, we are, our healing modality is chromotherapy. So you do have, that handout for people and then also send you the link for the the science behind the chromotherapy so people can look at that just another healing modality and then the next session which is our last which i can't believe <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about special days and holidays and how the grief journey continues so hopefully you join us for that and that again will give us a big picture and and kind of finalize this these um these sessions and and come to an end and then all this will be available for people to access afterwards so that's what's great about it too yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to uh, that, this one because when you're talking about uh, important dates and holidays, that's when, uh, if we're talking about loved ones that are family members, that's when we re, um, you know, reconvene, uh, we get to be around our other loved ones, and, uh, and, and that's a good time to, uh, to, I guess, prepare. I'm looking forward to learning Thank something you. next week. I might need to uh, ask you, just due to some travel, uh, we might move that up a day. Uh, but great. I'll, um, I'll take yeah, that offline fine. with you and we'll, we'll find some time. But Linda, once again, thank you so much. This is oh, awesome, welcome. awesome information and, uh, gives me a lot to think about today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.